Welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming to our webinar today. And we're going to be talking about how to create engaging testing. I'm James Kyle, and uh, I'm going to be going through this with you. We're going to have a question and answer session towards the end, and this is going to be sort of a relaxed, kind of an open forum where I'm actually going to go into Weight Trainer and demonstrate how to set up a few different test questions. Again, if you have any questions, go ahead and uh, type them in through GoToWebinar, and we will get to those during the question and answer period. So we're going to talk about you know, the steps to learning, and that's the gathering of the information. You know, what does that look like? The difference between engaging testing and the click through, you know, click next, click next, click next, take a test kind of a thing. That's what we're really trying to get away from. Uh, and then testing, which is what we're going to be doing here, and then how to take that in and use it uh, towards practical application, and most importantly, how to measure that. But let's just talk about the basic test question types that we have in Weight Trainer. We have the multiple choice type question. We've got the true-false questions, and we're going to try to help you create a better true-false question than you know, what a lot of us have seen where uh, you know, customer service is important, true or false. I mean, with those obvious true-false questions, they're, they're not really helpful. Um, and then free answer, which is not only a great way to get a detailed response in the employee's own words, but it's also a great way to ask for feedback, ask if they have questions. When you're learning at your own pace, in Weight Trainer, you feel more comfortable stopping and asking questions as where maybe in a facilitator-led classroom environment, you've got you know a big mix of people with different learning styles, and one person may not want to ask questions because they don't want to hold up the whole group. So the free answer question works in a lot of really great ways. And then the Likert scale. Let's talk a little bit about multiple choice questions first, just to kind of kick things off. The great thing about multiple choice questions is the user is going to be less susceptible to guessing. Now, if you wanted to you know, rearrange your questions later, let's say you have a 15-question test, and you want to change the order of those questions, that's certainly something that you are able to do. Um, and multiple choice questions can measure learning outcomes effectively if they're set up correctly. Most of the test questions, it's, it's the most reliable type, uh, and it is enhanced when the number of multiple choice questions are focused on a single learning objective. So you really want to focus on one thing and try not to add too much information into one multiple choice question. We're going to talk about that too. So here's an example of a multiple choice question that doesn't really work. Uh, it's proven through several studies to be, uh, you know, a little on the ineffective side because it increases the cognitive load and not necessarily in the direction that you want it to. Uh, certainly doesn't contribute to the best outcome. So, uh, and I know a lot of people can be tempted to set them up like this. So, I just, you know, threw this one out there. Um, in addition to our dinner rolls, our blank are also gluten free, and then you have the uh, possible outcomes or answers here. This is how you want to set them up. You want to ask a more clear, concise question. In addition to the roles, which item is gluten-free? This is going to help the learner focus on the objective, to focus on actually learning the material more than you know focused on trying to fill in the blank. Or an implausible alternative. Sometimes when we're creating test questions, we may run out of options and throw something crazy out there. How many breadsticks come with a salad? Two, four, five, or we want to make sure that we're keeping uh, our options very clear, very concise. And here's one. We won't stay for this whole thing. But this is when your answers can get really wordy. You know, if you try to put your entire mission statement or half of your policy training or whatever in, in your test questions, you're really going to be missing the boat. You can, however, use the free answer style question for an essay type response, but when you're building your questions, uh, want to make sure that you keep them clear and concise. 
We're going to talk also as we go through uh, and set some things up about the feedback option. And that's really all about learning. It's all about reinforcement. Uh, sometimes it can be really beneficial to help them get there. Even if they miss the question and the feedback pops up, it's going to give them, uh, as Meredith says, a hint. It's going to give them positive feedback or, or constructive feedback, rather, that's going to help them pass the test next time. So here's an example of how you can use the feedback option. And it is an option. Not everyone uses it. I think it's critically important in a multiple choice question to really drive that learning objective that you do want to use the feedback. Now, one important thing about it is if they get the answer correct, then it's going to give them the thumbs up on that. You know, when they submit the test, it's going to let them know that they, that they got it right. If they don't, then that's when the feedback option pops up. So here, uh, when greeting a guest, it, uh, it is always best to, and then I have my options, and I'm going to say that C, smile, is the correct answer. And if I miss that, if I choose, you know, provide a clear path to seating, and it's going to show me when I submit the test that I missed the question. So I'll already know that the question is, in, is, is incorrect when I submit it. But um, it's also going to give me feedback and let me know that this is the correct answer. Let's go into Spoon Bistro. I'm just going to very quickly create a new course here. And Meredith, if you could come in now, I know you're there, but um, if you could help me out for a minute, I want to create a new course on foodborne pathogens. And this may be a really great time for you to talk about the pin. So uh, if you have a moment to do that. Yeah. So James, have you already created the course yet? I'm going to do that right now create it from scratch. Mm -hmm. Hi everybody, it's Meredith. As, as James is, is setting up his course here, I'll talk a little bit about this new feature that we have, which is the PIN number. The PIN number you can see is the, the second field in and the, the middle column there, the first, first one in the middle column. You can put in now a four digit, uh, four numbers, four numbers for a PIN there. And when your users click on this course to take it, they'll see a, a field for that pin to come up. If they do not have a pin, they won't be able to take a course. So this is really nice for proprietary information that you want to make sure only people with access to the pin number can see this course. It's all also really nice if you want to control when a course is taken or where it's taken. Uh, in some cases, maybe only the manager has access to that pin and only when the manager pins a user in, they can take that course. Or in other cases, maybe that course will only be open for a certain time. Everybody has access to the PIN, but later on the manager can go in, update the PIN, and now everybody's locked out of that course. So those are a couple of uh, reasons to use it. But you just enter four digits, and any time you want to come in and change it, you just re-enter new four digits and, and click Save and that course will be updated. So it's really then about controlling the course, right, when, when people are able to take it. So if you want to have, let's say, a final test on something, in this case, uh, food safety and sanitation, and you want them to take that at a certain time, then you just distribute the pin at that certain time. Correct, exactly. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, very good. You know, and it's, it, it's interesting because sometimes um, a restaurant will talk about, you know, having people come in and take a test in the break room on an iPad or something. Um, so I can, I can see where that can be really valuable. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Merida. Anything else you wanted to add about this, this feature? No, it's just a really neat new security feature that we have, kind of an extra level of security for a particular course. So if mm -hmm. anyone wants to try it and tell us how it's working for you, let us know. We always appreciate your, your feedback on anything new that we add to the site. Very good. Okay, thanks, Meredith. Okay, so in continuing to set up my course here, I'm going to go in and set a passing grade for my test. I'm going to ask five or six questions on my test, and I want uh, my staff to be able to get at least a 75 in order to pass that. Now, for all of my existing chefs and bartenders will handle food let's get our servers um, get our runners outline oh, cooks there we go 
Um, I think for right now that's probably good. So I've selected the correct positions and now I'm going to select the due date for those people existing in my restaurant right now. I want this course to be due by Friday. And then if I wanted to if I hire a new chef or a new line cook in the future, I want this course to be due a week after their start date. And I want them to take it once a year. So that's, that's done. I'll activate this and I am putting this I'm going to put this in the location. Now, if I had a multi-location restaurant and I wanted this to be available to all of the locations, then I would go in and build this in the library and then distribute that from the library to the lo locations. But for today, we're more talking more about uh, test questions and we are setting up courses. So I'm just going to jump in and get this done. We're going to put it in location five. Okay, so let's go into my safety unit now. And it looks like my food safety and sanitation course is ready to go. Okay, so we have a blank slate. Now, you know, one of the things that I hear, um, you know, I'm working with restaurants around the world every day, probably, you know, at least 10 to 15 different restaurants. And, you know, there's still a lot of you know, people talking about how they don't have time to build training. And I'm going to challenge that today. I'm going to say, yes, you do. And this is how I'm going to show you a couple of tips and uh, ways to do this quickly. One thing that I like to do if I'm setting up a course is I will either make notes on a notepad, um, you know, get it in front of me, do it in a Word document. If I want to write the test out, you know, maybe paste a video link that I found any of those types of things so that I have these things ready and I'm able to look at them. Now you can also, I've built several tests on, on the fly and we'll add some test questions uh, here in just, just a moment at, as we go. And then I'll resize my window. So I've got weight trainer on this side and my content on this side. So the first thing that I wanna do is add some media so I'm going to do that by, let's start it off by adding a video. Now, I don't know how many today are using the video feature, but you know, YouTube is so widely searched. There really are some great things there. Uh, the weight trainer content store has some outstanding position training. Uh, you, we've got restaurants that are shooting their own videos. There's just so many options and video is really one of the most dynamic comprehensive tools that weight trainer uses and restaurants are having a ton of success with it so however you're doing that uh, it's a great tool so uh, having said all that I'm gonna start it off with a video link so I have this one okay so we're gonna paste the video in now let's just actually start doing the test questions so the video is going to talk about um, hand washing it's going to talk about the appropriate length to wash hands and you know what the leading causes of food contamination are. Uh, it's about two minutes long. I've got several other examples of you know links of covering the same topic. So uh, let's just jump into adding the test questions. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to add media. Everything you need to edit an existing item or create a new one is all here in this simple list. We're going to grab our test question. We're going to start with a multiple choice question. And I'm going to drop it in. And one of the things that I want to talk about also before I start adding questions is in menu training, in policy training, in any of the server training, position training, any of the content that you have, it's so important to add that interaction, whether you just ask a simple free answer style question whether you ask a, a Likert scale style question. Um, you do that because it really is the difference between that interactive learning and engagement on the employee's part or, you know, PowerPoint. Click, you know, read the slide, click next. Read the slide, click next. Um, I can't emphasize how much uh, we're trying to get away from that style. Uh, I've been, my background is in employee training since about 95 and, you know, I used to write the interactive training where it was the narrated PowerPoint on the CD-ROM and it was awful and it would just read the whole slide to you and you just click next and it was just, you know, mind numbing. And so what we're trying to do now is, you know, add that interaction whenever you can. 
um, whether it's a, you know, in your menu training or at the end of a topic. Uh, so let's talk about the different types of questions, starting with this one, the multiple choice question. And I'm just going to copy and paste Control C, Control V. And here's my question. The most common source of food contamination is. And then here I'm going to have five possible answers. So let's do guess. and food spoilage. And the correct answer is employees' hands. Now here's a way to use the feedback. And again, I can just grab this, control C, control V, and I've got it. Okay, so we have done our multiple choice question. And then here's a true-false question. So true-false, the, the real trick to a true-false question is not to make it so obvious. You don't want to make it real tricky with reverse-style questioning. Um, so I'm, so I'm sort of pushing the line here and saying it is unnecessary to wash your hands if you're putting on gloves. And the answer to that is false. So let's go to add media and let's add that true false question. I'm going to rearrange this and play the video first. Now I'm going to add the true false question down here. And here's my true false question. So I'm going to, again, copy, paste. Looks like I screwed that up. This is what I meant to put in there. And then here's my feedback. If they miss it, they're going to see this. And we're good. Now I have a couple of questions. I've got a true false. I've got a multiple choice. Let's talk about a Likert scale type. Am I pronouncing that right, Meredith? It's not Likert, right? It's Likert. I agree with you on the pronunciation there, James. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to say it. Sure, but I'm 98% I'm sure. That's how I've always said it for years and years, but I heard someone pronounce it differently the other day, and I thought, oh, no. <laughs> Okay, so here's the next one, and let's do the Likert scale type question. So this time we're going to add the Likert scale question. I'm just going to drag it down and add it right after the multiple choice question. And the statement, not necessarily a question, but the statement is this. I have every opportunity to wash my hands. And then it's going to be one on the low end is strongly disagree. And then high, strongly agree. And I'm just going to leave it there as a one through five. And I think that'll work really well. So let's take a look at that. And I want to reorder that. I want it down at the bottom. Okay. And let's go to a freestyle answer. And you know what I think I'm going to do? I think I'm going to add an image. You know, I want to kind of spice this up a little bit more. So let's grab an image and I'll drop one right there. And I'm going to go in and choose a file. And let's see, I have some restaurant pictures here. I'm just going to, let's see, I just need to find one. Let's use this one. I'm just choosing a random picture here, but did you notice that when I go to choose an image, when I go to you know choose a document, any of these things, I have them stored in a folder, 
So anytime you're building a course or a test or any of those items, you're always able to go and find the things that you need very, very quickly. So I'm going to align this to the left. I'm going to make it half the size because I don't want it to be a great big picture. And there we go. So there's some, there's a true, false, multiple choice, Likert scale. And now let's do the freestyle answer. So let's do a free response. I'm just going to drag it down here. And the question is, now the reason I'm asking this question and demonstrating this one to you is we also have an expected answer feature. And what that allows you to do is if you enter your expected answer here, then it gives you, it basically gives you the correct answer that you're looking for and you have something to reference when uh, you're looking at how the employee answered. So it's very handy in speeding up your test grading. So I'm just going to put my expected answer of 20 seconds right there. And we're good. So let's see. Here's another great way to use a multiple choice question. And I'm going to limit this to two choices. Now, you can use one single choice and just basically say, I have read and understand this, and then you, know, you can enter the word true or something, and you can have a simple sign-off. And because your employees have, um, hopefully, they've all gone in and updated and personalized their user passwords in Weight Trainer, this is how you get paperless documentation. This is how you can get them to sign off on documents and policies. And so this is a great tool. Um, I always give them the option to disagree. So maybe they don't like it for whatever reason. Um, I'll give them the option to say, no, I disagree with this. So I'll say, I have seen and understand food safety and sanitation video and agree to its terms. And then I'm going to give them the chance to say yes or no. Yes is the correct answer. If they say no, then this is the feedback they'll receive, and they will be instructed to contact their manager immediately. Now, at the end of any facilitator-led classroom, you're always going to ask if they have questions, so let's do that with a free answer, free response. And we'll say, do you have questions? About and I'm just going to leave the free answer open because I want to hear the questions that they they have. And I can respond to that. And here we go. So in about what 10 minutes. We have created a course, we've added a video, added an image, created a test. This is a test that I can use in my restaurant for a very long time. If I want to come in and change the wording of some of these questions, if I want to add more, if I want to reorder them later, uh, I, can, I can do that. So they're not constantly in the same order. And let's preview this and see if this video link works. Come on now. There we go. And I'll mute that. So now the employee can come in and watch the video. If I'm having any sort of an issue hearing it, I can turn on my subtitles. So now I can go through and watch the video. It's going to talk about you know everything from what to do if you're sick, if you have a wound that you know can't be covered with a bandage or any of those types of things, but this is just a really well done food handling video, about eight minutes and 29 seconds long, and just does an excellent job going through the whole thing. And I found that today, when I was putting the slides together uh, to come in and do the webinar, I was able to find this video in just a couple of minutes. And then I have test questions. I could come through 
and answer them. I understand it. Do you have any questions? Nope. I have every opportunity to wash my hands. Of course I do. And I'm done. I can submit the test. So that really is what I wanted to show you. We are recording this webinar. We're going to provide the link afterwards. If there's anyone that uh, could benefit from this, we definitely want you to share that with them. And with that, we do want to go into some questions and answers. So uh, Meredith, do you, can you help me pull up the questions? Yes, I can. Okay. So it looks you. like our first question. Mm -hmm. Our first question here is from Dean. Okay. And Dean asks, any way to change the font, add bold underline into the questions or the answers? And right now, there isn't any formatting uh, for the question types. So they're, they're as you see there with the formatting choices. Mm -hmm. We have another couple of questions here. Can you print a uh, test that you've set up? And if you go back really quickly to the uh, topic, the preview of the topic there that you set up, James, mm -hmm. you can actually see there there's a little print icon. Uh, and the preview of the topic. Now, uh, it may not print exactly as you'd, as you'd want it for, for training, but you can print it out. And you can save it as a PDF. If you have a PDF editing program, you should be able to go there and, and edit that uh, PDF if you have that uh, kind of a program available to you. Perfect. Uh, let's see, there's another question here. Are there any copyright issues with taking content from YouTube? This is from Misty. Mm -hmm. No, the YouTube users have the choice of you know, whether they want to keep their videos private or un unlisted. Um, you know, YouTube videos are pasted everywhere in social media, on people's websites, um, everywhere. So if, if it's a public use video, if it's out there for the public to view, their goal is to have that video posted in as many places as possible. So the answer w would be no. Um, now, if you you know found a private video and you found a way to download that, you found a way to upload that, and use it or something like that, then absolutely. Uh, that would not be okay. But if you have videos that are, you know, out there getting hundreds of thousands of views um, around the world and they're pasted in every type of website, social media site, then uh, absolutely not. Those are those are great resources. And you know, one of the things that I talk about with restaurants a lot is that you know one of the the unrecognized uses for YouTube is in wine training, beer training. Uh, cocktails, you know, bartender training, in ingredients. There's so many really great videos that feature different wines and beers and brands and things. And you may not find one that's done by the manufacturer, but you may find videos that, you know, maybe there was a wine tasting or, you know, a beer festival or something where, you know, people can really speak to, you know, the, the, the type of product it is. And those can be tremendously helpful when you're looking to build ticket averages and do better drink training with your staff. And you can use the topic link feature in Weight Trainer to, you know, connect one of your entrees to one of the products that you're also selling. So that's that's my answer. And then we have another question here. Uh, about breaking up test questions, if you have 50 questions in a test, how do you insert page breaks? So the, the way to do that would be to add different questions to a new topic. And I actually you know, commonly suggest uh, people as they're going through training to think about how they, they plan to have their users train. If 
you're going to be training, if, if most of your users are going to be training on a, a computer, a PC or a Mac, a, either personal or at the restaurant, then five to ten questions per topic is a really great uh, you know, amount of questions on, a, on a, any given topic. If you know that most of your users are going to be using phones or tablets, other, other personal devices that they might have to access the internet with, you might want to set up just one or two questions on a, t on a topic so they don't have to scroll down as they're, they're going through questions. So as I'm talking about that here, James just pulled up, clicked on the Add Topic link. You'd put in the new name for your, your next set of questions, new topic name, new topic title there, and you'd go on and add your next set. So that's how I would add breaks in the testing so that your users don't have to scroll down any screen through 50 questions. Uh, I'd always break it up into smaller chunks. So there's also a, a question here about uh, including photos with, with questions. Uh, for example, they, they asked like a question that says, which of the photos below is our barbecue chicken pizza? Uh -huh. So you could do something like that with a multiple choice question. And that's a really creative idea, a really great way to build in, you know, some uh, thought-provoking questions is, is using images. So you'd say something like, you know, for the question, you know, which of the pictures below labeled A, B, and C uh, is the correct, you know, matches with our barbecue mm -hmm. chicken pizza. Yep. You'd put in the A, B, and C for the answers and then title the images A, B, and C as well. If James hovers over that image there for me, you can see when you edit it that each image has that title space. So you could say image A, uh, and then they just select for the correct one. Mm -hmm. It's a great idea. And I think the more visuals that you can provide, the more images, the more you know, interaction and test question, that's really when you're taking your training to the next level. It's so important to do that. If you're just adding a block of text to every page, then you really don't have much more than a manual uh, on online. And, you know, so having said that, it's also true that, you know, in general, restaurants won't have a lot of video and topic links and images and test questions and all of that kind of stuff. Typically, when they start with us, they don't have, you know, there's some, some cases where they do have all of that, but most of the time they don't. And so the idea is to, is to take that time, to schedule time, to go in and go through a course that may just be plain and not have very much to it. Here's, here's a, a great example of it. Um, I'm going to go to, just really quickly, I'm going to go to one of my other courses and I'll give you a great example with my beer menu training. Now, when I started with this beer menu, I had, basically, I had text, and that's it. There was no video. There were no images, no topic links. I was able to come in and add images and video and topic links and questions and complete this course with a series of test questions and all of these topics from start to finish in about two hours. Now, that seems like a long time, but also consider I was writing the questions, I was, you know, finding the images and finding the videos and putting all of those things in, but that's two hours of work on the front end and you're done. That's when, that's when Weight Trainer gets to the point where you can hire a person, first name, last name, position, start date, boom get their email set up, it's going to automatically assign their content to them. That's when you start to get to the easy side of Weight Trainer is once you've taken your content and gotten it set up. You know, if I'm coming in and I'm just seeing black text, no pictures, no images, I'm doing this on my smartphone, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of reasons, obviously, that, that we're not using manuals, but it sort of takes you back to that place where you know you're just looking at text 
and you're clicking next and clicking next and, you know, getting through it and trying to get to the answers and get out of there. We can do better. And that's why we're doing these webinars. We're going to continue to do these and, you know, continue to, you know, hear creative ideas from other restaurants. Um, Dean, I think you have a ton of really creative I ideas. You know, I like the idea of, you know, having images that you can choose from. There's a country club that has a, a guest recognition test. And every guest that belongs to that country club, they take their picture and they have their name. And they use that technique in what they call the name game. So the name game is something that they've set up in Weight Trainer where the actual test is there's a picture and the question is something like, who is this? And they need to answer either multiple choice. They can select the correct name, first and last name, because when you're in a country club, it's important that you know everyone's name. Hello, Mr. Wilson. Nice to see you, Mr. You know Johnson or whatever. It's, it's good to know that. So that's a way that they use that. Very creative, very effective. They've been able to uh, improve so much on their uh, guest recognition. So I love that, that that kind of stuff. It looks like we have some more questions coming in too. Meredith, you want to help me out with a couple of those? One more of the questions, uh, I think we've mentioned training on the mobile now, mobile devices, uh, phones and, and tablets. Uh, and we were asked if we have an app for Weight Trainer Plus. So the answer to that question is right now Weight Trainer Plus is responsive uh, for any device that you're on. So if you're on a phone, uh, the look and feel changes a little bit to accommodate that device. Same thing if you're on a tablet or you're mm -hmm. at your computer, the look and feel will change to accommodate that device. No, no additional app fee. Uh, no having to go to the app store and search for it and maybe get the wrong thing. Uh, you avoid those those kinds of things with the Weight Trainer Plus site. Yeah, it, it absolutely scales to any size. And I have, a, um, I have an Android Turbo, and I use Weight Trainer on my smartphone all the time, and it works very well. I, I can even set up courses with it. It, it, it works very well. And I think that might be it for questions for right now, James. Okay. Very good. Well, folks, we're going to continue doing these webinars every two weeks. We also are going to continue to encourage you that if you do have a question, please let us know. And, you know, email can be the best way to do that because um, we will be prepared with the answers. If we get an email first and you kind of explain to us, um, you know, what the issue is, um, then we have a minute to, you know, research that, see what the issue is, and then be better prepared once we contact you to uh, address that. Uh, one thing I did also want to mention is we do live tweet these webinars, and we're using, um, what's the hashtag, Meredith? I'm sorry. It's hashtag weight trainer support. Hashtag weight trainer support, and you can always contact us here. Um, at support at weighttrainer.com and on behalf of Weight Trainer I would love to thank everyone again for taking the time to come out uh, if you have any questions let us know and we will talk to you again next time thank you thank you